Hello, I'm Femi OK. Today on the stream, this 92-year-old man returns home seven decades after he was forced to flee for his life. We'll meet him through the eyes of Al Jazeera witness filmmakers who followed his moving story. But first, here's Malik Bilal with a look at what people are sharing online from Independence Day celebrations in India and Pakistan. Thanks, Femi. Tech companies have joined in on the celebrations, offering Google doodles like these here, reminders on Facebook like this one, and Snapchat filters to mark the anniversaries. Meanwhile, musicians from both countries released a peace anthem combining the national anthems of India and Pakistan into one song. Have a listen. But this anniversary is also being used as a show of military might, with displays like this air show in Pakistan featuring jets from Turkey and Saudi Arabia. And in the border town of Waga, a daily military drill took on special meaning for the occasion. Every night, the sunset ceremony features army members from both countries in a display of cooperation. But those displays aren't always visible in national policy. The arms race between the two countries is still going strong, as this interactive from Al Jazeera Labs shows. And there's more where that came from. Head over to aljazeera.com for photos of today's celebrations, interactive infographics, and more in-depth coverage of the anniversary of partition. So for more on what's happening during independence celebrations in India and Pakistan, we're joined by Kamal Haider. He's our correspondent in Islamabad, Pakistan. Kamal, it's so good to have you. I'm just wondering if you notice any difference in this year's Independence Day celebrations for India and Pakistan because of the anniversary of partition. What's different? Well, that's a great question. Actually, when you really think about it, the 70th anniversary meant something really special. Perhaps both sides wanted to reiterate in some way or another that they were very much there. If you remember, at the time of partition, everybody thought, wait a minute, are these, got, are these countries really going to survive? People thought India would fragment, Pakistan would fragment. But that hasn't happened, and you've got a young population a very young population in both countries, which is looking towards uh, redefining its role. Unfortunately, I feel that perhaps there should have been soul searching because the whole generation just put that aside, didn't want to think about it. I mean, it after all, it divided families, it divided villages, it forced people out on both sides. There were massacres. So I think in a, in a way, the 70th anniversary there had to be a hype, and we saw that hype, certainly in Pakistan on our side of the border. I'm sure the Indians would be equally patriotic, but mm -hmm. both seem to be in a state of denial when it comes to resolving the key issues between them, because after all, they have so much in common, whether it's language, whether it's mm. humor, whether it's history. Mm. And ironically, both were united when they had a common enemy, and that was the colonizer, Britain. But after that, the divisive politics, divide and rule, everything fell apart. I mean, if you really ask me, when Pakistanis and min Indians meet overseas, they don't see those barriers. But once they're in their own countries, then it's a different ball game. Kumar, I've been looking at Narendra Modi, the Prime Minister of India's social media. There's a lot to look at. Today, he says, honored to address fellow Indians on Independence Day, sharing my speech from the ramparts of the Red Fort. Let's have a little listen to what he said today. Use of violence in the name of faith cannot work in this country. This country will not accept it, and that is why I appeal to my countrymen. During that time, the call was quit India, but the call today is unite India. That idea of quit India was quit India. The Brits get out of India. And now, 70 years later, what do you make of the way that Prime Minister Modi spoke to India? Well, you, you know, they say that actions speak louder than words. I mean, you look at what's happening on the ground, unfortunately, uh, ever since uh, Narendra Modi's come into power, he's of course promised economic prosperity and a boom and, you know, bringing India uh, to the first world power status. 
But at the same time, you look at the situation on the ground, it's appalling. I mean, people have turned their medals in, writers, intellectuals, scholars. And what has happened is that whether Modi knows about it or not, uh, the extremists are on the loose. There are organizations that are committing atrocities against minorities. So I think Modi has to really prove on the ground that he means what he says. A lot of these politicians, whether they're on the Pakistani side or on the Indian side, it's, they will paint a really rosy picture telling the world how uh, great things are, what a utopia they have achieved. But at the end of the day, I think, as I said, you know, actions speak louder than words. At the moment, what's happening in Kashmir is something that a lot of Indians would be worried about, I'm sure. And there are the issues, but Let's see what happens. I hope he means it for the sake of his people and for India and for Pakistan. People online hope the same thing. This is a tweet from Nisar who says, I hope the Modi speech from the Red Fort brings some change in current hostile and intolerant environment. I hope for a peaceful year ahead. But some of our community members, Kamal, aren't uh, quite so sure. This is Onuki, and he says, will there ever be peace between India and Pakistan? What has been the hindrance? And of course, I, you know, earlier you said that there has been no real effort in resolving some of the key issues. There's been some rhetoric. So what do you make of this? It's, it's looking into the future, but do you see there being peace? Well, you know, uh, if you really look at it, look at Europe. I mean, Europe fought two world wars. They were at each other's throats. If you go back, uh, there were smaller states. They were just killing each other. And look at Europe today. It's become a joint entity. I think at the end of the day, what needs to be done is that for both powers to realize that the uh, you know, that they will not progress if there is hostility. Look at India's uh, stance vis-a-vis -vis the corridor that China is building. China has offered the same to India. I think Asia can become a huge power if it is able to resolve their differences. Mm -hmm. And especially to be able to address causes like Kashmir, other causes, all the causes. But like you're right, possibly the ground reality, unfortunately, is going the other way. And sure. although there is room for cautious optimism, not everybody is hopeful that they will be able to have peace anytime soon. Mm. Kamal Haider, it's always a pleasure having you on Al Jazeera, particularly so on the stream. Take care. Thank you. Before I die, I want to go back to where I was born. These are the words of a 92-year-old Christian Kumar Khanna, who returned to Pakistan 70 years after he was forced to flee during partition. He was part of the mass migration that took place when India was divided at the end of British rule. Al Jazeera's Witness documentary series followed Christian Khanna on a journey to see his childhood home. पाकिस्तान जाना चाहता मुझे शेख उपरा देखना है मुझे अपना घर और दुकान भी देखनी है हमने तो बिल्कुल मना कर क्या करना है पाकिस्तान जाके वहां से तो लड़ाइयां हुई मार पटाई हुई सब हुआ तो वहां क्या करना जाके पाकिस्तान का बॉर्डर पार करके मिट्टी भी को जी बंदे को जाए सलाम अलैकुम That music, really, it sounds like Disney does partition. <laughs> so heartwarming. You see here, this is my heart. It's very warm right now. The co-directors of the film join us to talk about this remarkable story. Prashir Mazumda is an independent journalist. He joins us from New Delhi, India. And Clement Gargulo is in France. Welcome to the programme, gents. 
both of Hi. you. Uh, it's exciting to have you here because our community is really excited about being able to ask you questions. So I'm going to dip right in. This is Ihsan, who when he heard you were coming on said, that is great. I would love to ask them, how tough or easy was the filming process? And of course, this was a very, as Femi mentioned, heart-wrenching and warming film following one person. What did that take? How long the process was that for you? Clement? Uh, um, it took uh, approximately one year uh, to, to, to arrange uh, the, the shooting and to complete the shooting. Uh, first, we had this uh, like kind of emergency to, uh, to follow Mr. Kana because uh, the first time uh, we, I saw him, it was at the High Commission uh, um, of uh, Pakistan in India. And he was already uh, having um, uh, his visa and he was ready to go. So we had to, to arrange uh, our visa to, to travel there. And uh, uh, thanks to, uh, thanks to, the, to the High Commission, we, we managed to get it in, in such a, uh, quick, uh, quick days. So we, we, we followed him uh, during a, a first trip. Uh, basically, and uh, uh, we spent there like uh, uh, maybe uh, it was five days, mm -hmm. and uh, we came back, and uh, we he wanted to go back again, and we made an, another trip. Uh, recently, it was in May, so uh, we spent again like uh, five days. So yeah, it was a, a year of, uh, of of shooting. Of course, we we went back to to his home during this time. To uh, to build a relationship with uh, with the family. Clement, don't tell uh, everybody everything, otherwise they won't watch the documentary. <laughs> Leave them a little bit to make them want okay. to go online and watch it. Prashin, I'm just wondering, this gentleman, he was like the best documentary subject. How did you how did you decide that he was the right person to tell a petition story? What was it that his story did for the partition narrative, Prashin? I think what uh, what's important was that Mr. Khanna has this razor sharp memory. Like he can recall things which happened 70 years ago and uh, say it like so like so vividly these memories come out. And that's why his whole uh, his whole role as a storyteller, you know, like he can he can mention things and incidents which happened so long ago. And that's why I think that Mr. Khanna was the right person for this documentary because he can he experienced so much. 70 years ago, he built his life here. He got di displaced during that time. And still after all this, he wants to go back. He, it's his last wish. It was his last wish to go back once. So that's why like, I felt he's the right character to, to tell our story. There were some frustrating moments though, because Prashin, you couldn't get to Pakistan to follow the story. Tell us why. Uh, as an Indian, it's so difficult. It's like, it's crazy to not get a visa to go to Pakistan. Like it's a neighboring country, but because of the relation we have with the country, it's very, very difficult for an Indian to go to Pakistan. Uh, it took Mr. Khanna so many years to actually get a visa. So like, yeah, it of took course him, I couldn't it go took to him Pakistan. a decade, correct? It took him a decade. To it get a visa. It took him 10 years, like, yeah, yeah. So it has been, it was like uh, 20, for 20 years, he was thinking about going back and finally he mustered up the courage to actually visit the embassy and see what's the visa process like. But still like they refused him so many times and then they finally relented. Uh, like I couldn't wait for 10 years to go to Pakistan. So mm. that's the reason like uh, it's extremely difficult for anybody, for any Indian to actually get a visa to go to Pakistan. Yeah. And we're actually hearing that from uh, people online. This is Zainab. She says she wanted to go to uh, a family, uh, for a family visit for a cousin's wedding. She had to provide a lot of documents despite having a formal invitation. She goes on to say, I couldn't believe I needed to provide electric bills and other documentation to support my cousin's application to come visit. Another person writes in on how he uh, wanted to go to India and says his uh, startup was nominated for an award, but he couldn't go because Pakistanis can't get visas. So, uh, Clement, I know that you were at the visa office uh, when your your subject there, your documentary subject, was getting his. Talk about that elation or what that feels like to have tried for so long and to finally be getting it. And you, of course, were at the right time, the right place. Yeah, <laughs> this is a chance of, uh, of, uh, of the documentary uh, uh, sometimes. So, uh, yeah, I, I just basically was just behind me. I was coming to uh, to uh, to apply for a visa uh, and uh, and uh, he was just behind me with uh, with uh, 
uh, some uh, relatives and I just asked them like what, what are they doing and he was coming also to, to take a visa so yeah that's the chance of, uh, of the filmmaking sometimes you need that uh, and to, to make a great story and uh, uh, like like maybe maybe we did <laughs> let me just show you a picture audience of um Mr. Kana and Mrs. Kana here. Mrs. Kana is smiling, but Prashun, she was not that enthusiastic about her hubby going to Pakistan. Um, that's an understatement, correct? Uh, it is an understatement mm -hmm. because uh, uh, I remember when it was the second trip when he was making, uh, a, like, he was invited by a school there to give a speech and uh, he was about to visit Pakistan. This is like just a week before uh, he actually went back. So we were speaking to Mrs. Khanna and uh, she was angry. She was like, uh, I would call it a discussion, but it was more of a scolding that she gave me. What did she say? Uh, because, what did she say? Uh, she said like, uh, I don't want him to go back. Like I have bad memories of the place there. I don't, re I don't really know why he wants to go back, why he has this burning desire to actually visit the place where we saw so much violence and everything. And uh, I don't know why he wants to go back again and again. Like what's, what's this connection he feels with this country? And uh, yeah, it was difficult to convince her, but yeah, Mr. Khanna did it. Mr. Khanna convinced oh. her, Mr. Kanva, uh, Khanna convinced the family. And uh, I, I think we should be really thankful for Mr. Khanna, uh, to Mr. Khanna for doing all this because it's a tough time, like, yeah. Because the family, uh, they were really concerned how Mr. Khanna will manage in Pakistan. But yeah, it was his energy and his desire to go back, which eventually made it possible. So there's a question here uh, via Facebook from Faiba, who says, what reaction did they get from the people of Sheikhapura when the latter got to know that an Indian would be visiting them? Uh, so Claymont, of course, because you were there, what was the reaction of, of people in the town? But uh, they didn't know that he, he was coming. Like uh, he, he just arrived uh, in his car, and uh, he, he wanted to to first to uh, to go to uh, to his house or to the market first, uh, where uh, his father owned uh, owned a shop. And he just arrived, and the people were like uh, surprised, of course, but very welcome. Like they just offer uh, a tea, and uh, and they they start talking and spend the full uh, afternoon there. And uh, it was such a great moment for him, and he was. Uh, touching uh, uh, the, the rice and speaking with the farmers and he was remembering uh, the, all the place and uh, he was going up, uh, taking the stairs up to the fourth floor to have a view and uh, he was so dynamic. Taking, and, uh, taking the stairs at 92 years old, I just want to reiterate that part, 92. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and you have to run after him. I had to run after him. He was always awake before me at 4 o'clock, 3 o'clock and he was walking alone in the streets just to, to take the most of the of the air from Pakistan and, and to to have a chance to meet so many people, uh, he, you know, he had like such a long day there, and uh, it was it was tough time for the for the crew to uh, to follow him. <laughs> there's, a, there's a moment in the film where you get a, the great sense of his incredible personality, but also a difference between younger generations, younger Indians and younger Pakistanis, and how they view partition. Have a look at this visit. Mr. Khanna goes back to his old school. Have a look. Madhab to ne sikha tha aapas mein bair rakhna aur master bhi shauk se padhate the. Bade shauk se master padhate the. Beta, ye aapke jo samne khade hain, inka naam hai Krishna. Ye 1940 mein yahan is school mein padhe gaye hain. Dahan jawab. नफरत 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 क्यों क्यों है? है? है। दोनों मुल्कों में को आदमियों से नहीं है गवर्नमेंट को गवर्नमेंट से नफरत है 
if people don't have any hatred for Sean. I love that moment, and I think our audience connected as well. There's a tweet here from Amar who says, I visited India as a Pakistani multiple times. I felt the love from the locals, though I feel there is increasing resentment against Pakistanis. And of course, you know, the clip that we just showed could say that that is also true in the reverse. What do you make of that moment? What did that mean for you? Uh, personally, I think that's like my favorite moment from the entire documentary because uh, uh, Mr. Khanna's answer, it sums up the, the sentiments of a lot of people here, what they feel about Pakistan. Like there is a lot of curiosity about what actual Pakistanis think and not what just the government or the army does. So that's why I feel like with Mr. Khanna's answer, he really summed up everything we do feel about Pakistan, the younger population. And uh, of course, there, uh, when we read about Pakistan in the newspapers, what we mostly read is about the violence there and there, there has been some blast here or there. But what we really want to do is connect with the Pakistanis there. And of course, there has been uh, dialogues and uh, some cultural exchanges between both the Indians and the Pakistanis, the younger generation. And I hope like it continues over the years. Kaimut, were there moments that you had to just leave out of the film where you thought, there's no way we can make a one hour film. It's only going to be half an hour. We have to cut this out. What were the bits you had to cut out that you really didn't want to? But the, the, the school sequence is, is, uh, was endless because you wanted to, to go in each uh, school uh, classroom. Mm. So in uh, each classroom, we had uh, such uh, moments. So I remember one of, one of the classroom, one of the students uh, just uh, asked uh, the, the Mr. Kana, would you help me to, to get me a visa to see uh, the Taj Mahal? Oh. Oh. So it was like one of, of, of the moments that we had to cut. But uh, for me, it was nice like to see him like uh, just mm. dream, dreaming of seeing like a uh, one of the monuments that he, he dreamed and uh, asking the, the Mr. Kana to, to help him to see that. So, and of course, Mr. Kana said, of course, I will help you. I will invite you and uh, let's see how it goes. Maybe another, another movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, before you get to the other movie, there's a tweet here from Naz Nigeria who says, how do you think this documentary impacts both Indian and Pakistani viewers? And what do you hope to achieve? Uh, uh, Clement, do you want to take that one? Uh, basically, I, I'm sure Prashun will have a, a better feeling about that because he's still in India. I'm in France right now, so maybe he can have like a, 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 a better feeling of uh, the reaction uh, there. Prashant? I can add some stuff after a bit. Uh, I think the basic feeling of the documentary is about hope because uh, this is a man who witnessed the division of the country, but uh, he still harbors no ill will or hatred towards Pakistan. And uh, this is something which I think a lot of us can actually take from him because uh, at the moment, currently, the whole uh, environment around both India and Pakistan is a lot of resentment and hatred. It's, uh, but I think with Mr. Khanna and his thoughts, we can really hope for a better and more uh, peaceful future. Right. The thing is maybe like what... what what could change? Maybe it's like they, they're going to receive more and more uh, visa requests from both uh, countries. And I hope uh, maybe one, uh, most of them will be now uh, uh, accepted. So let's see how, it, how this goes. <laughs> All right. We've tantalized you with the filmmakers of going back to Pakistan 70 years after partition. Let me show you this here. Have a look here at my laptop and you can see where you can see it. You go to www.aldazir.com slash programs, look for Witness, and you will find the documentary there. You can watch it online. Now, we continue our look at other parts of our network and what we're doing for Partition. I want to give you a little bit of a preview of part two of 101 East two-part series. It's a documentary called Borders of Blood. It airs this Thursday at 22.30 GMT. And 101 East team are looking at the younger generation in India and Pakistan. Have a look at this. She invites us to an online chat between students in Karachi, Pakistan and Mumbai, India. Hello. Hi. Hi. Can you see us all? Yeah. yeah. Some of these teenagers have ever spoken to someone across the border. Mumbai again is very, very famous for its street food. So we have all kinds of street foods. Like you can find whatever you want anywhere. 
And what I'm trying to do now through my work is get them to talk to each other and get them to access these alternative histories that are present, whether it's through Skype exchanges or whether it's to, through talking to my own students, you know, and working through the stereotypes and challenges. And remember, we're doing a full week of shows dedicated to the partition at 70 on Wednesday, Kashmir.